Thank you very much. Um, menopause, I've been told that's what I should talk about today, menopause and medicines. And first of all, what I would like to, I mean, I understand the, the audience, they're very vast, so I need to have an idea of what you expect from this talk, okay? I'm going to try and make it as interactive as possible because I think, well, for you guys to be here, it's because you want to know about it more or you have questions you want to ask. So let's go, just give me maybe just five points and hopefully I'll try and go through it. I'll try and, be, I'll try and cover it all, but I want to meet you in between. I've also come in with preconception ideas of what I want to tell you, but it might be different from what you want to hear. Okay, so first of all, HRT and which one to go for? Okay. I, I would like to know the alternative to HRT. And I would like to know why later. Okay. Please. Excuse my writing. I'll put it down. Okay, we'll stop at 10. <laughs> well, am I pushing it? So, symptoms. Realize it. You might not realize it's actually due to menopause. Symptoms of menopause. Okay. Lovely. Thank you very much for having me. I mean, I can't remember how many times I've been down to Wilbledon. I think probably I can count on my hand. But thanks for having me here. I'm from North London. So we're talking menopause today. Menopause and medicines. 
And when I was going to prepare this talk, I thought, I know what menopause is, but how can I say it to other people? And you're meant to have definitions and things like that. So the Royal College of Ops and Gynae defines menopause as a natural stage in life of a woman. And it's part of aging. So it's one thing that we're certain is that every woman will go through it if they get to that age. And it marks the time when a, a woman's period stops as her ovaries stop producing eggs. That's what the RCOG says. But then I found something else. Menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation that results from loss of ovarian follicular activity. So your ovaries stop working and that's why you go through menopause. And like I said, menopause is going to affect every woman at some time of their life. And in the UK, the age that we think, um, approximate age that people go through it, is 51 years old. But having said that, life expectancy in a woman now is about 83, 83.6 years. So you're going to find that you're going to be postmenopausal for about half of your life, or one third of your life. So we need to be talking about it. We need to know what it's all about. We need to take care of ourselves. And it's not just about us women. It's also about men as well knowing what it's all about. Because it affects not just your workplace, not just you personally. It affects your home life, your social life, and your workplace. So if the men and people around you and the younger ones have no clue what it's all about, then we're failing. I was given a story about <laughs> earlier on. When I was much younger, I couldn't understand it. Because if you come in, in my early 20s, early 30s, for early 40s, and you're talking about hot flushes, I'm looking at you and thinking, what's the big deal? Wipe your face, get, put on the fan, <laughs> go outside. So what exactly are you talking about? Because we, I didn't have a clue. So we need to talk about it. And I'm glad we're talking more about it now, about menopause. So the symptoms of menopause can last. Some people are lucky. They just sail through. One minute, period stops, bam, bam. Nothing happens. And life continues. Some people, months and years before, the symptoms start. You're still having regular periods. Go to your GP. Unfortunately, some GPs have not much understanding about menopause. So they say, yeah, you're not menopausal yet. You're still having a period. You can't have treatment for it. You can have HRT. Just carry on. So you spend years in agony where you don't get help. But I think that's changing a lot now, and people are having more understanding about it. OK, so sorry, I've already skipped a bit. I was meant to do the overview, which is what we're going to talk about, what menopause is, symptoms of menopause, treatment, which starts with lifestyle, HRT, alternatives, mm -hmm. complementary and alternative therapy, the risk and benefits of HRT, and resources, where you can get help apart from your GP. Okay, next slide, please. So, we've done a bit of that. So, perimenopausal. This includes the period where you first have your first clinical symptoms of menopause, your first hot flushes, or your period starts getting irregular until 12 months after your last period. It's because menopause is actually, it's diagnosed as 12 months after the last period. You could have no periods for 11 months. The moment you have one, at your 11th month, you're not menopausal yet, you're starting again. Because you could have the irregularity and it could take a while till it stops. But when it stops, when you have no period for 12 months, then you're menopausal. Hormones, it's a waste of time saying, doctor, can you check if I'm going through menopause? Because it's not going to show on blood test or anything. It's actually a clinical diagnosis. Obviously, if you're younger, which is the early menopause, or what we call now call um, premature ovarian um, insufficiency, which is when your periods start, stop or become irregular, and it's not due to all the causes, but because your ovaries are trying to fail, that's usually before the age of 40. Okay? So, uh, me. yes, please. If you're, if you're having, like what you just explained, yeah. um, irregular periods, that means you can get pregnant at this time? 
you can still get pregnant because your ovaries haven't failed. And what I find is that people going through menopause in their 40s or even their 50s think, I can't get pregnant. I'm about to go through the change. My daughter's already had a baby. I'm a grandmother or my son's had a baby. I'm a grandmother. But let me tell you one thing. Um, termination of pregnancy is highest in the very young and in the 40 plus. Because there's this delusion that my periods become irregular, I'm going, to, I'm going through menopause, I'm having all the symptoms, I don't need contraception. That's another thing. You do need contraception until you had no period for a whole year. Yes, please. I think I'm confused with you as well. But you think the thing about it is that nothing is absolute in medicine. You, for those, for the clinical staff, we know what we say. This is what is meant to be. But we still have the fluke ones, which we can never understand why. There has to be a diagnosis. But like you said, I had a patient who we were treating for early menopause. Well, sorry, I shouldn't have used that word. but. Premature, the new word is premature ovarian insufficiency. We'd taken some bloods, she'd come in for, she was a 33 year old woman, wasn't getting pregnant, she was in the fertility clinic in the hospital, and we'd diagnosed premature ovarian failure. And we were sending her letters to come and see us. And then she finally turns up six months later, and she had a hijab on. <laughs> Okay, and she goes, and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. You've gone through the change, your FSH is raised, you have to. Unfortunately, you might have to try donor eggs. And she goes, the reason why I've not been coming to the clinic is because I'm pregnant. <laughs> so under the hijab, there she was, pregnant. But we think she's had premature ovarian insufficiency she's had no periods for two years so I it happens mm -hmm. but those are exceptions to the rule so if you're going through menopause and you think except you really don't want to have you want to have a baby go and get contraception <laughs> or else so we've got induced menopause as well, where the period actually stops because of surgery. We've had your ovaries removed, or the ovarian function has actually stopped because of chemotherapy or radiotherapy, or even treatment with um, gonadotrophin-releasing hormones. I'm sure a few people know what Zoladex is. That's part of it. But you see, it's not permanent. The induced one or iatrogenic menopause might not be permanent, except the ovaries been removed. So things could come back and the ovaries could get kicked back in. Okay. The term um, premature ovarian insufficiency, which I've alluded to already, in the past we used to say premature menopause. But menopause, the word menopause is meant to be permanent. But we know that some women, things might kick back in. So we don't use that anymore. Nor do we say ovarian failure. So we use the term premature ovarian insufficiency because some women can actually be having regular periods and actually their ovaries are failing, okay? And things like this, it actually could run in families. It could be chromosomal abnormalities like um, Turner syndrome. It could be genetic. It could be due to chemotherapy. It could be due to radiotherapy. It could be due to infection, okay? And then you find some women will actually have it after they've had a hysterectomy, but their ovaries have not been removed. Surgery can do that as well. You also have women who are doing treatment for fibroids and they've had uterine artery embolization, and then they find that their ovaries are also failing as well. So ovaries could still be there and that happens to them. And there's been observational studies that have shown that some women with HIV actually could go into premature ovarian insufficiency. Whether it's due to the disease itself 
or whether it's due to the treatment with antiretrovirals, we don't know. But we do know that about 12 to 14 percent of these women will actually present with menopausal symptoms. Someone asked about the physiology. So we ovary produces three main steroid hormones. So we've got the estradiol, got the progesterone, we've got the testosterone. And for women who haven't gone through menopause yet, the ovarian function is actually controlled by two pituitary gonadotrophins, and that's the FSH and the LH. So you have the hypothalamus producing the GnRH, and the GnRH then goes to the anterior pituitary hormone, which we then produces the FSH and the LH. The FSH acts on the granulosa cells to produce the an inhibin. We don't talk too much about that, but the other branch is where we talk about. So the FSH also stimulates the granulosa cells to produce estrogen, and the LH produces the um, acts on the theca cells, which produces the androgens, the testosterone, and that sometimes goes back into the granulosa cells and produces the estrogen. So when you have estrogen as high enough, right, it causes a negative feedback so that you then don't produce much of your FSH. So it knocks off the production from the anterior pituitary gland and the top. So when you go through menopause, so menopause is when your ovaries fail. It's not working as much as possible as it should. So from when you're young, before birth, you've got your follicles in your ovaries and it's all coming up. So by the time you're born, actually you'd have knocked off a few follicles and then you go through puberty, your follicles are going and you're still throwing a few about. But as you get older, your ovaries start failing. Okay, And then what that means is that you don't produce as much estrogen. So if you're not producing that much estrogen, your brain, your pituitary gland thinks, oh, I need to flog the ovaries more. Starts producing more FSH and LH, which could be pulsatile. And by doing that, starts to knock the ovaries to produce more estrogen. But, est but your ovaries, are, they're not working so well. They're not sensitive to it anymore. And that is why when you're menopausal, one year post after having a period, when you check your FSH and LH, it will be high. And that's when you diagnose it. So you, sorry, go on. When the test for menopause, it normally tests for the FSH level. When what? The FSH level is tested during the test for menopause or something. Is that why it's up deep when it's high? That's when it shows that there's menopause. Postmenopausal. So don't, but you only do it when the woman has had no period for a year. It could, it goes up and down. It's positive. So you wouldn't test it for checking whether you're menopausal. It's, it's more so when the woman is young and has had no periods, that you do the FSH LH, and you're thinking, she's had no period for a year, what's going on here? Especially if she's having symptoms, because some might not. So you want to see, is it early menopause, which is between the ages of 40 and 45, or is it premature ovarian insufficiency below the age of 40? That's when you check it. Because otherwise, it means nothing. I mean, obviously, some people would check it if you're thinking of polycystic ovarian syndrome. But then you would have irregular periods. So maybe one or two in a year, or three or four. But less than every year, every month. OK? Are we good? So we go to symptoms of menopause. I don't, I'm not sure, I think most of us know what it is while we're here. But I thought I'll put that picture up just to whet people's appetite because there's, we're, no two women are the same. No two women are going to have similar symptoms. No two women are going to have the similar experiences. But it helps in looking at it and thinking, oh my God, that's what it is. And it's reassuring. It's not that I'm going mad or anything, but it does happen. Vesomotor symptoms, which is the fancy name that we talk about as clinicians, we say. So the vesomotor symptoms are the hot flushes, which could be daytime or nighttime or both. So when we talk about hot flushes, um, it's this intense heat from within. 
that just comes over you and usually the upper body to your face and you end up sweating so much with it. You can also look quite red and flushed as well. You can also have palpitations and fluttering of the heart. Not necessarily at the same time. So it's, those are the vasomotor symptoms. Then you get the psychological symptoms, the depressed mood, the anxiety, the irritability, the mood swings. The number of patients that come to me and say, doctor, I'm about to kill my husband, <laughs> help. And once they start HRT, two months later, honky dory, the husband comes to say, thank you, doctor. You know, so it's, <laughs> that happens. Feeling tired, lack of energy, loss of concentration, not able to think, impaired memory, we all talk about it. Brain fog, sleep disturbances. You can't sleep, your husband's snoring beside you. You feel like, get up, or your partner is snoring beside you. You feel like, get up. There's this feeling of, of personality disintegration where you think, I'm not, this is not me. You're not functioning properly. Your personality seems to be changing before your eyes. You have panic attacks. You get angry. You get tearful. Tearful over little things that you have no clue what it's all about. And then you get angry. You start an argument. <laughs> and then an hour later, you sit back and you think, what was that all about? <laughs> but you can't help it. And it affects your home. It affects work. It affects your interaction with friends. And different people, like I said, have different effects. Some people, luckily, sail through nothing. But you have the extremes where people can't cope and they're quite depressed and they can't understand, they can't get up in the morning, they're tired, they can't concentrate, and the physical symptoms are devastating. Sexual dysfunction, loss of libido, no sexual desire, you have difficulty achieving orgasm, you have pain when you have sex because of the atrial, um, vaginal atrophy. Everything goes dry, your skin goes dry. It goes dry down there. So you try to have sex, it's painful. It bleeds, it's uncomfortable. You try your lubricants and it's not helping. And you could actually have pain, uh, bleeding as well during sex, but it's actually due to the atrophy down there. But that's after you've done, a, make sure your smear's up to date and there's nothing going on with that. You have genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And this is actually due to the atrophy of everything down there. So we're talking about your bladder and your vagina and your womb. Because in, when in embryo development of a baby, they all come from around the same area to, for growth. So when you have lack of estrogen down there, you also have symptoms, you have urinary symptoms. So you get burning when you pass urine you're passing urine more often than usual. You have recurrent UTI. You go to your GP, it's burning. When I pass urine, I'm passing more often. He does, your, he, he does the urine test, there's no infection. He checks you for diabetes, there's no diabetes. What's going on? It's probably a trophy of your bladder. And all you need is vaginal estrogen, which would help, or even proper HRT. You have incontinence, you have problems passing urine. And then you have the problems with the vagina as well where it's painful having sex, it's burning, it's itchy down there. Are we good? Yeah. Then you've got the musculoskeletal symptoms, we all know. Your body aches, your joint, you have joint pains. The joint feels more, it feels so stiff. And you actually see your muscle bulk reducing, especially if you don't do any form of exercise which is also very important to get the muscles going. So treatment. As clinicians and non-clinicians. Sorry. Non -clin Sorry, can I just ask a question before you go into the... Yes, please. The, the symptoms about the incontinence. What causes that? Why? 
It's because of the estrogen with the bladder and the urethra. So sometimes it doesn't function as well as it should. So if you've got pressure, yeah. So the sphincter doesn't work so well. So you can actually lick urine as well. So the it's rare. Estrogen is preventing your muscles from, from working well. Yeah. Okay. So lack of lack of estrogen in that area as well okay. can cause that. It's amazing. <laughs> this estrogen. <laughs> Pelvic floor exercises. That would make better. <laughs> that would help as well. Uh, exercises. Pelvic floor exercises and estrogen. So you've checked your pelvic floor exercises. You've gone to the urologist. They've done all the tests. They can't find anything wrong and all that. And they try some vaginal estrogen and things are better. So treatment. Like I said previously, no two women are the same and no two women would experience the same thing at the same time. Next slide, please. So starting first, I would say lifestyle. Having a healthy lifestyle, which would include exercise, diet modification, reducing alcohol, will improve or can improve your menopausal symptoms in addition to improving your heart and bone health. So when we talk about diet, low in saturated fat, very important for your heart. Salt, reducing salt intake, which will also reduce your blood pressure. Diets rich in calcium and vitamin D. We talk about vitamin D a lot, but we don't talk so much about calcium. Obviously, sometimes it could be just tailored to that individual, but what you need to make sure is that it's not just taking your calcium and your vitamin D, it's also we know exercise helps your bone health. And that's very important. How many people do 10,000 steps a day? How many people do 8,000 steps a day? Six? Six? I think you should. So except you're doing active exercise, apart from walking, I say to people, I hate the gym. I'll be honest with you, I hate the gym, but I love walking, mm -hmm. and especially during summer. I mean, the weather's lovely, but five o'clock is bright. You can go for your walk. 30 minutes, one hour, you come back, still enough time to get ready for work. Mm -hmm. And that's what I sell to people. Mm -hmm. So if you like jogging, better still, <laughs> as long as you watch your knees mm -hmm. and make sure you get good shoes to wear, good footwear. Exercise not only about that, uh, about your bone health, it also re relieves stress and it lowers your risk of heart disease. Okay, smoking? Stop smoking. Because we know that smoking actually increases your risk of going into menopause early and also triggers hot flushes. Smokers also have a higher risk of developing osteoporosis Heart disease, and heart disease is the commonest cause of death in women. Drink alcohol, drink in moderation, okay? Alcohol actually increases your hot flushes and is associated with increased risk of breast cancer. And the advice actually is that women should not have more than two to three units of alcohol a day and actually have one day of alcohol free in a week. So when we talk about two or three units, that's a glass of wine, okay, and a pint of beer. What's that, a day? A day, not more than that. <laughs> no, okay, if you don't drink it, that's fine. I'm not saying go for it every day. But I'm saying for those who drink every day, who have a glass of wine with their meals, Think about it, okay? Make sure you have one day free. Relaxation techniques. So we've got meditation, we've got... So sorry, I was going to say caffeine as well, isn't it? Yeah, caffeine will also make it worse. Your hot flush is worse. Triggers it off. Thank you very much, Demi. So relaxation techniques, you've got meditation, you've got yoga, all that can reduce your stress levels and it helps with anxiety, which is part of it.
talk about treatment types. Hmm, I think this is where everybody wants to be. <laughs> so, like I said, the ovaries produce estrogen, they produce progester um, progesterone, and they produce um, testosterone. So those are the things that are missing, or on the levels are much lower, to, and that's why you're having the symptoms. If you've had her hysterectomy, all right, that means you don't have your womb. So we've got, we want to replace the estrogen because we know, especially estrogen is what gives you the vasomotor symptoms and also the um, psychological symptoms. We, we need to replace that to help with your symptoms. By the same time, if you've still got your womb, we have to give you progesterone to protect the womb from developing cancer. So what we say is, if you've got your womb, to we can't give you estrogen on its own. So you can't be on opposed estrogen. So we give you progesterone as well. And the progesterone can be in form of the marina coil, okay? Or it can be in form of tablets or even patches. So we've got different forms of HRT. We've got the tablet oral, we've got gel, we've got patches, we've got implants. And Marina probably will say is part of the HRT because if you've got a womb, we have to give you progesterone. Okay. So if you're perimenopausal, that is you've not, you've still having periods, you've not gone through the change completely, but you're having the symptoms. We don't know how long those symptoms are going to last for. Nobody knows, some people are lucky. Bam, that's it. Some people months, some people years. The symptoms are becoming unbearable. The treatment, especially the vasomotor symptoms and the psychological symptoms, HRT is what's best for you because it would help you. And that's what the guideline says is the first line for a perimenopausal or postmenopausal woman to go on HRT. So if you're perimenopausal, you have sequential um, therapy. So what do we mean by that? If you're still perimenopausal, we want you to still be having periods, okay? And that way we know nothing's wrong. So they're different, you have the, if you're going to have a tablet, your GP will prescribe it and the pack, they will show it would be sequential. Sometimes they already have it as day one, day two, and things like that, and what you take at the end. Or if you're using patches, you know when to, they are different patches. So the patches will be, an example will, will be Everol sequelae. So you have estrogen for about 14 days and they add some progesterone at the end for the other 14 days and then you will have a bleed. If you're postmenopausal, you go on to the continuous one, which will have estrogen and progesterone. And I, if you're postmenopausal, the last thing you want, I mean, I don't know about you, to not have periods is great. No more tampons, no more pads. So the idea that you start bleeding again is what you don't want. So they give you the continuous one, which can be oral, or it could be um, transdermal. Um, so that's the patches. If you're perimenopausal, you also have the oral and transdermal. If you've had a hysterectomy or you have a marina inside too. Sorry, did someone want to ask a question? Yeah? Sorry, I just want to ask about the, um, the HRT and blood clot. And blood clot. We'll get there. Thank you. Definitely get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Thank you. So in terms of the oestrogen, if you've got, if you don't have your womb or you've got a marina in place, so you have just oestrogen. So with the oestrogen, you can have the oral one or you can have patches. And I'm going to explain why I'm more towards patches. I'll explain later. So in terms of the patches, you have the patches, you have the gel and you have the spray. When you're going to use, if you use the gel, you have to make sure that your skin is dry and you don't wear any clothes immediately, okay? And we will then talk about the safety of HRT. Why, why do we say go on HRT? It's mainly because symptoms can be quite bad. And 
we need to improve the quality of life. Gone are the days where our mothers and grandmothers accepted it and just carried on with life and didn't even talk about it. I, I, I mean, I don't remember my, pe my mom talking about it. They just dealt with it. And sometimes I sit back and I think, is it that they didn't have symptoms? <laughs> or we're a bit flaky now? <laughs> or we're just flaky where we're thinking every little symptom is like a big deal now. But I don't think we're flaky. I think we just, uh, nowadays, 40, 50, 60 year olds are young. In those days, once you start having kids or you're 30 or 40, you're old. <laughs> and you just kept quiet about any menopausal symptoms you might be having. But now we're living longer. We're, look, we're taking care of ourselves better. And we need to even make it better and have a good quality of life, which is quite important. So what she effectively said was, shut up, get on with life. And that was their attitude. But we know better. We know that it's not just about the symptoms, which can be devastating. I mean, I remember winter, before I started my HRT, winter, I would open the windows. My husband would be like this, <laughs> under the duvet. Are you still married? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but he couldn't understand it. And I'm like, aren't you hot? <laughs> He's looking at me and thinking, no, I'm not. <laughs> and the mood swings was unbelievable. I mean, it took me a while because, you know, we also think we can deal with it, we can move on and all that. And this is even, it was my early 40s. And I thought, you know what, I'll deal with it, get on with life, you know. And then after a while, one day I sat back and I realized that when I walked through the door, everybody scuppers. <laughs> the kids go into the room, the husband goes into the study and everybody shuts the door, it's like, she's here. <laughs> and that's when I realized, actually, my behavior was deteriorating, was appalling. So I'm not just I'm saying this from experience, and I think that's why I'm passionate about it. We can laugh about it, but if we don't have an understanding of it and realize it and have an insight, we will know that we need help, and we will know that all you need is HRT. My husband might tell you you need a, a, a higher dose now, you know, that sort of thing, but hey, <laughs> to get better. But that would help that. It would help your sexual function, your loss of libido, your pain on having sex, all that, the atrophy, and also osteoporosis. So we're talking about osteoporosis, thinning of the blood. It's not just HRT, it's also for um, lifestyle modification. And we know that in women with um, premature ovarian insufficiency, and also women with um, early menopause, we tend to encourage more of the HRT to also help with the bones. HRT is there, you can have HRT. You can also have your vitamin D and calcium and make sure your diet's rich in that. When we talk about, for postmenopausal women, the calcium intake is actually 1,000 milligrams a day, sorry, yeah, 1,000 milligrams a day. No, 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 I think I probably got that wrong. Micrograms, micrograms, sorry, micrograms. I knew I got that wrong, it didn't sound right. And vitamin D, 1,000 units, international units a day. And it's been shown to actually be, show significant protective effect against osteoporosis and related fragility fractures. And Yes, and also preventing osteoporosis both in your spine and hip. So, to prevent osteoporosis, how long should you take, would you take HRT forever? So if you've got a family history of osteoporosis, um, would you, because my mum's got it and I think my nan had it, so you know, for me, you know, would, would, you know, 
a week for something you take for quite a long time, HRT, and obviously manage risk factors, other risk factors. I think, it's, like you said, the managing the risk factors is very important. Mm -hmm. Doing the exercise is also very important. But are you going to be on HRT forever? Mm -hmm. If that's the only thing. If it's just for osteoporosis and you're no longer having all the other symptoms, mm -hmm. then maybe you should consider something else. Mm -hmm. Because I will want you at the age of 70. Not that you can't have it, because that's the only thing that it's now out there is that it's not that you can't have it, because you have women, uh, patients at 70, who have tried to withdraw HRT from, and they have very bad symptoms. As long as they understand the risks that it might incur, they, they, they might prefer that, because in terms of quality of life. But if for you, if it's only osteoporosis at the age of 65, 70, you might want to consider other options. Heart disease. I mean, the British Heart, um, Heart Foundation data shows that the um, heart disease remains the, the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in women in England, in the UK, sorry. And recent studies show that women initiating HRT below the age of 60 or within 10 years of menopause, more so in those who are just estrogen only, resulted in significant reduction in athero atherosclerosis progression, heart disease, and death from cardiovascular causes, as well as all-cause mortality. So if you're under 60, or you've had, you became menopause less than 10 years ago, HRT is good for you to reduce that risk. Go on. People, some people say the studies, there's so much dispute about that because I think it depends on the individual. Okay? It depends on you, what symptoms you're having, what you want to achieve if you can get off it. Most people say you go on HRT, especially in those who are, who've got premature ovarian insufficiency or early menopause. They say till the age of menopause, 51. But if you're still having symptoms, some people say carry on because you have to weigh and balance how you're feeling. Some studies will say for five years, some people will say stop at 60, some people say don't, don't stop if you're symptomatic. So it really depends on the individual. So risks, oh sorry, roots, we talked about the oral, um, transdermal, intrauterine system, that's the marina I talked about. Vaginal is usually in terms of gel, so in terms of a cream, and that's usually if you've got symptoms down there, all right, and you really don't want to have HRT, so the risk, cardiovascular risk is not there, risk of clots not there, risk of breast cancer is not there because it's just a local absorption, okay? Implants. In, in the 90s, early 90s, it was quite in vogue for women to come in after they've had their hysterectomy and you as a young SHO, you have clinics and you're putting, you're putting, you're putting the estrogen implant and the testosterone implant for the woman. It's something that's quite rare now because we have a lot of options. But in the United States, they still do a lot of testosterone implants. In England, maybe privately, but on, in the NHS, I think they hardly do that. I haven't seen one come out of the hospital for a while. Someone asked me down there about the risk. So we do know that combined HRT, so HRT having both estrogen and progesterone, is associated with a small increased risk in breast cancer. And the risk is low both medically or in, or in statistical terms, particularly when you compare it to other lifestyle factors like obesity, smoking, and alcohol intake. So 
if you're overweight, your risk of breast cancer is actually higher than if you're on HRT. And some studies have actually showed that if you have HRT, if you're using HRT, and you develop breast cancer, you actually do a bit better because it's not so invasive. All right, so it's a way of reassuring. Same as alcohol as well. But those who are taking just estrogen only HRT show that the risk of breast cancer is quite minimal, if at all. Especially if you're using the transdermal ones, estrogen, your risk is pretty very low, if any, if any at all. So when we're talking about risk of breast cancer, we need to look at the lifestyle factors as well to sort of say whether it's worth it or not. So next we've got endometrial cancer. That's where we're talking about the unopposed estrogen. So if you give estrogen, you must give progesterone as well. If you don't give progesterone, the risk of endometrial cancer is there. But if the woman has a womb, you shouldn't be given estrogen on its own. It should be combined. So that risk is zero. You've got venous thrombosis as well. There's increased risk of, th of venous thrombosis. Hi. Hello. Sorry, just quick question. That risk with unopposed estrogen uh, and endometrial cancer, is that not there if it's just local use? So if you're just using the local general estrogen gel, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be using it without progesterone if there's still a womb. Even if it's just local use? Even if it's local use. Okay. And the vagina might be immune, don't you? Yeah, oh. as in local as in vagina. Oh, vagina, then that's fine. Yeah. The risk is reduced you vagina. You don't need no, 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 you don't. You don't, sorry, thank you. I was thinking about the um, gel. Yeah, not, not topical, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Is it still healthy in womb? Sorry? Is it still healthy in womb? Your vaginal estrogen is fine. Yeah, we good? So venous thrombosis. There is increased risk of venous thrombosis in women who take oral estrogen. Studies haven't shown any association with that, with if you're using transdermal. Your risk of thrombosis is actually much less. If you're using, it doesn't, there's no association between um, venous thrombosis and if you're using transdermal estrogen. So in women who are over the age of BMI, because now we know when you're overweight, sorry, if your BMI is high, over 30, you have increased risk of clots anyway. So in women like that, what we suggest is that you use transdermal HRT with a marina to protect your womb if you still got a womb, or to use micronized progesterone. Okay? Because the micronized progesterone actually reduces the risk of clots, especially in someone who already has a high risk. Yes? Yeah, that's transdermal. Sorry, patch. Transdermal um, HRT. So patches, gel, and spray is fine. Okay, yes? I wouldn't advise it because then you're, you shouldn't do that. Because the patches, you should have estrogen in your patch. And if you've got your womb, you should have progesterone in your patch as well, or the marina, or micronized progesterone. Because if you've got your womb, you have to protect the womb with progesterone. Type 2 diabetes, HRT doesn't affect it. I just put it there just to elevate your fears. And if you're diabetic, your blood glucose control is not affected by HRT got ovarian cancer. The absolute risk of ovarian cancer is, is thought to be one in 1,000 women. So one woman in 1,000 who has been using HRT for over five years could be there. But if you also look at it that as you get older, risk of ovarian cancer increases with age as well. Hypertension so controlled hypertension is not a risk factor for you not to use HRT. I've talked about endometrial cancer. Cervical cancer, no increased risk with HRT. Colorectal cancer, actually, 
what he showed was that there's this trial, the Women Health Initiative trial. I don't know if you heard, but a few years ago, that's what came out. And everybody thought, oh my God, we can't do HRT. And all the women had to come off HRT because it causes cancer, it causes clots, it causes this, it causes that. But years down the line, they said, that's a good thing about research. They continued the research. And they've actually noticed that in terms of colorectal cancer, HRT actually reduces your risk of having colorectal cancer. But if you're on estrogen only, so that's more of the combined one, so it reduces the risk, but if you're on estrogen only, there was no effect either way. Go away. I haven't. I haven't, but I do know that some women, there's been observation studies that have shown that some women do have increased moods, and it depends on which progesterone. So you can play around with the progesterone to see which one's better. There are some progesterone that are as, as well that have increased risk of clots compared to some others. So if you're going to have your progesterone, I will actually advise that if you've still got, obviously you're having progesterone because you've still got your room. It's either you use the Marina or you use micronized progesterone. Is that no, no, it's a tablet. Yeah. Micronized. I think it's a tablet. Don't get me wrong. Could be a spray. I prescribe it. I don't know what it looks like. I leave it to the pharmacist to tell you what it looks like. <laughs> It could be. Is it a spray? It's a tablet. Thank you. It's a tablet. <laughs> you confused me there by saying, is it a spray? It's a tablet. I've got my colleague here. <laughs> Risk of stroke. Oh, sorry, I didn't put it there. Risk of stroke. There are conflicting studies on that as well, in that the risk of stroke is actually age-related. So we know that the risk of stroke under the age of 60, as long as there are no other risk factors, is low, so it's okay to use HRT. But we know that oral estrogen is associated with a slight increased risk of stroke. But we think that it might be dose related. So it might be better if you've got other risk factors of stroke and you need HRT to actually start with a very low dose if you're going to use the oral one. The transdermal estrogen, so we're talking about your patches, your gel, your spray, is unlikely to increase the risk of stroke above the woman's baseline risk already. So if you're under 60, we know that your risk is low. We know as you get older, your risk of stroke is higher, and we know that transdermal one doesn't increase it. The type of progesterone can also increase your stroke. So it depends on which progesterone. So we always say you either use the micronized one or you use didrogesterone. Yeah, thank you. Um, just making sure I didn't miss anything. So people talk about HRT after cancer as well. That, oh, if you've had breast cancer, you can't use it. I think it's discussing it with your oncologist and your symptoms. Some people will say, no, no, contraindication, especially if the tumour is oestrogen um, sensitive. But then discuss it. It depends on your symptoms and what you, your oncologist and your gynaecologist feel. Endometrial cancer, if you've had it before, there's no reoccurrence with HRT, especially in the early stage endometrial cancer. If it's advanced stage, something else. Have a discussion. There is no adverse effect on the survival rate in ovarian cancer. So you can go on HRT after ovarian cancer. Cervical cancer, same thing. Vulva and vaginal, um, vaginal cancer, the same thing. So someone wanted to know about testosterone. Testosterone is one of the hormones, um, sorry, uh, yeah, hormones that are produced of the ovaries. And Lately, it's come out, and we're talking more about it, in that we, we, 
clinicians, we always knew that testosterone was all, is necessary for sex drive, for your libido, for your sexual arousement and things like that. So we're beginning to prescribe it more for women, but it's usually after you've tried HRT and you're on the HRT, all your all the symptoms are doing well, but your sexual drive and um, libido, it's still a problem. Then you can go on progesterone. But then we have a problem in that there's no formulation of testosterone for women yet. So there are no formulations for women yet, okay? So it's the formulations we have are for men and we're, we're beginning to give it. So they can be in terms of, they're usually gels. Like I said, there is the implant, but the implant is in the States. We, in the past, in the 90s, I remember putting implants in women with estrogen who've had hysterectomies. But in England at the moment, there isn't what. And usually it takes about eight to 12 weeks before the difference is noticed. And if you need to, you can have a chat with your GP. Some GPs are very uncomfortable about prescribing it and they might have to refer you to the menopausal clinic. If you're on any form of contraception or anything that's going to stop your period, right? So you can tell whether it's that that stopped your period or menopause that stopped the period. What I'm trying to say is that it's not going to change my management. So if either you're a 51 year old woman or 54 or 45, if you come in with menopausal symptoms, I'm going to treat you with the menopausal because that's it. Is it going to change my management doing a blood test? It's not. So why am I doing it? You will get all the side effects, so you, you get more hair, hair, acne, okay. and things like that. And that's why it's very important that they don't take too much. So it should be checked then a few months later with the androgen. You can if you want. You can. I mean, I personally don't. Because, I, because I'm quite selective who I give testosterone to. So the first, be, first thing is you'll be on HRT for a while. When I'm in a while, not forever. So I expect your HRT would have kicked in in three months maximum. And if you're still having very bad libido, there's a problem and you have no other symptoms. So other symptoms are fine. I might say, okay, you started with 50, let's try 75. Still having problems, then I'll go testosterone. Yeah. So alternatives, for those who don't want HRT, we've got the pharmacological ones. So we've got things like um, the SNRI, so the antidepressant venlafaxine. that's very good for your, for your depressed mood and also for your hot flushes. Um, it tends to sort of improve your quality of life as well. But it's usually more of um, your depressive psychological bit. You've got the SSRIs as well. You've got paroxetine, fluoxetine, citalopram. So that citalopram is very good for the anxiety bit of it and improves your quality of life. Um, you cannot use, if you on tamoxifen, you cannot use paroxetine, fluoxetine and sertraline. But you can use citalopram. I should hope that if anybody's going to prescribe you on HRT, they will be aware of that, especially if they want to put you on antidepressants instead of HRT for those who don't want to have HRT. We, there's something called clonidin as well, which is um, years ago we used to use a lot of it and we just up and up and the woman still comes back with very bad hot flushes. It doesn't work, you're shaking your head. <laughs> it doesn't work. But sometimes we have women who absolutely don't want HRT. We try it. We give it to them and they say, okay, we'll see. And especially for the vasomotor symptoms, not the depressive symptoms. Obviously, if it makes you depressed, it's worse. So for the vasomotor symptoms, and especially if they're also hypertensive, because it also would bring your blood pressure down slightly.
So we've got gabapentin as well, which is also a painkiller, and some people use it as um, improves, it will improve your quality of sleep and reduce pain. We've got pregabalin as well, which is also we use for pain. I didn't put it on there, but also is also being used as antidepressants nowadays. So, herbs. Mm -hmm. Someone said, mm hmm. So, in terms of the herbs, we've got things like, oh God, it's, it's tongue twisting. Phytoestrogens. And I think that's what you also get in yams. You've got St. John's Warts as well. You've got soy isoflavones, which if you go to alternative, I'm sure Helen and Barrett and things like that, you can get that from there. And black cohosh. The problem is what's the dosage? What's the right dosage? And things like that. But you can try them. Definitely try them. Next, please. Acupuncture helps with the stress levels, will help with versamotor symptoms. Okay, next. Cognitive behavioral therapy does help. It works with your behavior, helps with the behavior. At the end, I'm going to give you this, uh, we'll, we'll, I think it will click, where you can actually do it yourself, self-help using this website for cognitive uh, behavioral therapy to help. You've got yoga, stress level, meditation, help you reduce your stress level, put things at bay, homeopathy, for those, I'm sorry. I think I've been medicine for too long and I think conventional medicine, everything and all that. And the homeopathy, people who use it believe it works. There's no harm in trying. That's all I can say. <laughs> Flexology works. Relaxing, reduce your stress levels, help with meditation. Aromatherapy, I love that. <laughs> so you chill and go for it. I think. Essentially, it's, I've sort of talked through that. So essentially, it's being there and taking care of yourself, knowing what menopause is all about, understanding those symptoms, those around you understanding it. For those who are young, understanding why your mom's like that. For those who are older, knowing where you're coming from and what you could do differently. And apart from we talked a lot about drugs and all that, for lifestyle, as much as we throw it out there so often, we're so busy in our lives. How many people do exercises? We eat a lot of junk food. We don't look at low saturated fat. The more salt it is, the tastier it is. Put salt in it and things like that. Okay, in terms of resources, We've got the medical, I'm sorry, the British Menopause Society. They actually have a website that you go in there and most of the questions, most of the things I've spoken about is in there. And they can, you can also get um, information from there. You also have the Women's Health Concern, which is universal. You can go into there and get more information. Yeah, it's not contraception. I think we need to lobby the government because a lot of women are beginning to, and needing it. And it should be like contraception. And it should be, it should be, you know, you know, you know when you're pregnant and you feel those forms or you've got diabetes and I believe HRT needs to be one of them. If anybody can start the campaign Any other questions? Yeah, monthly. You can have three months, three months each time. The patches is three months, yeah. You can have three months in each time, yeah. And do you get checked in between the time? You know, like why they say your blood pressure. 
They should check it. First of all, is check your blood pressure when you first start. After three months, they should check your blood pressure, height and weight. Are you doing well with it? Any problems and things like that? And after that, you could go for a year. Sorry, is there someone at the back? You need to come back for the second talk. 5th of August. 5th of August. HRT and menopause and fibroids. 5th of August. Yep, sorry. There is. And I think whether it's because of the HRT or because of your age, because we know when you go through the change, you also gain weight anyway. If you're postmenopausal, you should have a continuous one. If you're bleeding on a continuous one, you should be referred to your GP ASAP to have a look. It's actually a two week referral. The two week referral because you're not meant to bleed, especially if you're on the continuous one. If you're on sequelae and that's happening, they might adjust doses and things like that, but if no, you shouldn't. And if you're postmenopausal, you should be on continuous, and if you're bleeding, then it needs to be checked out, scan and it probably hysteroscopy as to the reason why. Then you might find nothing. It could be atroph atrophy down there, and then you need vaginal estrogen. One thing I didn't mention is that you can be on HRT, systemic HRT, and if you're still dry, dry down there, you could have vaginal estrogen as well. So there's no contraindication.